do you know, it's fantastic to be here in, in Hollybush. Uh, Jill and I were just trying to work out when it was. And we reckon it was back in the 1980s. We brought a whole bunch of young people down from Richmond. And we, we stopped in, was it in caravans or tents or both? Tents. tents, that was it, in the field out there. And uh, for the youth camp. And Jim, you don't look any older than you did then. <laughs> the sheep can run faster. <laughs> Fantastic. And I remember there was, there was Rodney Brecken and there was Jonathan Dunning and Carl Gidney. God, their names from the past. Wow. Anyway, the Lord has blessed this place over the years and made it a blessing to many, many people. Do you, do you know, I can't quite remember the context, but there was some uh, guy in the Bible, um, and I, sh I shouldn't really know the Bible a bit better than I do, but Israel had been in a battle, and uh, they'd put their enemies to flight, and they were chasing after them. And it says of one guy or a bunch of fellas, they were faint but pursuing. Okay, how many here tonight feel a bit faint, <laughs> but you're still pursuing? <laughs> I think I'm one of them. <laughs> anyway, tonight they've given me a really lovely light subject to bring to you after you've had a good dinner and you're all feeling sleepy. And it's a lovely, bright, uplifting... Actually, I'm being a bit facetious. If we get this right, it really is uplifting. And the subject is repentance. And I tell you what, repentance lifts a load off you when you really do get it right. So if I can work the technology uh, and, oh, look at this. Oh, hang on. That's a chorus, isn't it? <laughs> here's my heart, Lord. Here's my life, Lord. I'm seeing it all pass before my eyes. <laughs> do I just keep clicking till... Oh, I go backwards, do I? No, I'm, I'm clicking to the right. All right. Okay. This is where I want to start. This is Jeremiah. Now, please don't, don't think I'm being irreverent with the Lord. But when I read this scripture, I thought of Victor Meldrew. You know, Victor Meldrew, what's his famous saying? I don't believe it. And you know, I think God is actually saying to his people through, the, through Jeremiah in this verse, I just don't believe it. See if you can work out why. You shall say to them, thus saith the Lord, when men fall, do they not rise again? If one turns away, does he not return? Why then has this people turned away in perpetual backsliding? Should be on the next one, I think. Okay, just trying to get the next verse. Okay, why then has this people turned away in perpetual backsliding? Gone on two now. <laughs> I'll just keep reading anyway. <laughs> they hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. I have paid attention... And listened, but they have not spoken right, rightly. No man relents of his evil, saying, What have I done? Everyone turns to his own course, like a horse plunging headlong into battle. God is really saying, I just don't get it. I've pointed out to you where you're wrong. I'm looking for you to change things. And you're just not listening. And so if God can say, I don't believe it, he's sort of saying it here. Do you know, if we don't let the Spirit of God change us, then really we're wasting our time because God is all about change. Um, repentance is actually the stepping stone of growth. God will show us where we come up short but then we must, by faith, choose to change and accept his grace at work. We must decide, do I follow myself now or do I follow God as he's leading me? And at this point, we actually know what step we ought to take. But we don't always take it. We don't always want to take it. 
Here we go again. Okay, do be patient with me. I tell you what, I'll just carry on. I'm sorry, Luke, I'm not such a technocrat as I ought to be. <laughs> in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, it describes repentance in a very insightful way. In fact, it doesn't even use the word repentance. It says we must turn from our wicked ways. And repentance requires that we disown, destroy, or get rid of whatever was sinful. It also requires that we turn to God. It's a U-turn on the spiritual road of life. Now, I'm sure I've told you this story before, uh, certainly in Billingham. But a friend of mine in Richmond used to go up to Durham every day. Uh, but his family, his parents, lived in the Midlands. And one weekend, he was going to visit his parents. And he jumped in his car. And it was only when he passed sort of the turn off for Aycliffe or somewhere, he thought, what am I doing? I'm supposed to be going down to the Midlands, to the Birmingham area. And then he thought, but the car's running so well. It's almost a shame to stop it and turn around and go the other way. But you know what? He looked for the first opportunity, pulled off the A1, the A1M, whatever, turned his car around and drove in the right direction. Now, it was a bit inconvenient, but it would have been a lot more inconvenient to have kept going the wrong way. When you realise you're wrong, you've got a choice. So repentance is something positive. It actually puts you on the right path. And you're going to go somewhere. You're going to get to your destination. Uh, and repentance is one of those ouch words that we're all afraid of. In fact, jokingly, I said to Jill earlier, I ought to get one of those A-boards and walk up to the platform with repent ye all over it. Okay. Uh, and because most people treat it as, 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 as a bit of a joke, the idea of repentance. But I want to say it's not a joke. And we've been hearing stuff this weekend that has touched all our hearts. No matter how long we've been following the Lord or how short a time we've been following the Lord, there's been stuff there that we need to hear. Uh, something that just occurs to me, we've just had our car MOT'd. And uh, what a relief, it just went through it without any problem. It was the first MOT, so it's not such an old car. But I can remember the sort of, I can remember the days when the only cars I could, could afford to buy, uh, if I put them in before they were MOT, they cost me a fortune, and, then, and they, then they weren't guaranteed to pass. And if I put them in for an MOT, they were almost certain to fail. Okay. And somebody said to me once, listen, why don't you take it to... And they mentioned the name of a garage. Because he pa he'll pass it. But you know, there's no point in that, is there? I want to know that the motor I'm driving is safe. If there is something wrong, I'd rather know about it, even if it's going to be painful. Even if I'm going to go, ouch, that hurts me, where it hurts Yorkshireman the deepest, and that's in the wallet. <laughs> As Jim will understand. Um, but thank the Lord... God in his love and his mercy. So this weekend has been like a sort of spiritual MOT. Okay? So you might need a bit of body work doing, or your brakes might need adjusting, or bleeding, or something. Your wallet might need bleeding. <laughs> you know, there was an occasion when some people were telling Jesus about a tower that had fallen over in the Siloam district, I think, of Jerusalem. And they were sort of or intimating that they thought these people must have been really wicked people for that tower to fall on them. I think 18 people lost their lives. And Jesus said, no, it's not because they were more wicked than all the rest. But he says, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And Jesus was thinking that there's a day of reckoning coming, a day of judgment to come, when we'll all stand before the Lord and we need to be in the right place and condition. Oh, sorry. By grace we can be, of course. And unless there's repentance of sin and turning from wicked ways, salvation cannot and will not occur, let alone, let alone revival. And uh, on another occasion, some uh, Pharisees came to John the Baptist and said, we'd like to be baptised. 
And John the Baptist was a very straight speaking man. And uh, he just said, you know, who warned you vipers to flee from the wrath to come? Bring, bring forth fruit or behavior, actions fitting for repentance. So repentance uh, has continued outward signs of its reality. And it has fruit because obedience follows a turning from sin. And those who've truly repented will have clear signs to show for it. 2 Corinthians 7, 8 and 11. Shall I have another go, Luke? No? Fair enough. <laughs> Luke can see how proficient I am in IT. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 7, verse 8 and 11 says, Though I caused you sorrow by my letter... Now understand, this is the second letter Paul's written to the Corinthian church. He's written one already, and he's put his finger on a few things that were wrong. And it did upset some of them. But he said... Although I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Though I did regret it, for I see that what that letter, it caused you sorrow only for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God. God, that's one in the eyes, for God wants you happy and prosperous forever after. And I do believe God prospers us, and I do believe God blesses us. But I also know that God is more interested in our holiness than in our comfort. You were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow, has produced in you. What vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. Paul did go on a bit, by the way. In everything, you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. And so in this passage, Paul is teaching that being sorry in the right sort of way can be a real turning point in your life, can lead you to repentance. Paul had rebuked the Corinthians for various sins in his first letter, and he knew they'd been sorrowful, but he's now saying, I'm glad that that letter had the effect I was wanting it to have. I wanted to see change in you. And the exciting thing about true repentance is that it can produce in us anger at the sin that we fell into. So much so that it motivates us not to go back to that anymore. And it also motivates us to encourage others to avoid the same pitfall. Produces in us a healthy fear of God and a fear of the consequences of sin. And it also makes us passionate to do the right. Because we see perhaps more obviously that God's ways are the best ways. So if anybody's been a little bit upset this weekend so far, and I do know there's been some tears, and that's not a bad thing if it's, like Paul was saying, producing f good fruit in our lives and good change. And it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Now, in the days when you didn't get into trouble for physically chastising your children, okay, I'm old enough to have lived through days like that, and I'm not talking about brutalizing your children. I'm just talking about, I, I had three lads and one daughter. And believe you me, I was more like a lion tamer sometimes than a, than, than a dad. And occasionally I had to administer, uh, you know, shall we say the rod of correction or whatever. And I can remember saying some words that my dad said to me. And I just thought, how pathetic. Can't you think of something more original to say? And I said to one of my lads, don't worry, this hurts me more than it hurts you. <laughs> Which wasn't really true. Shall I tell you what one of my sons did uh, once when he knew it was coming? He, he stuck a book down his trousers. And when I told him to bend over, I knew there was a book there. And I just thought, the little monkey. And then I thought, but I admire his uh, initiative. <laughs> so I... I just tapped him and pretended that I hadn't realised. And afterwards, I heard him telling his, his brothers and his sister, hey, I put a book down my trousers and Dad didn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I knew, but I was a kind dad in spite of having to do that. And of course, nowadays, we have different ways of dealing with these things, don't we? Still believe in discipline, but maybe a different form of discipline. It's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. We, 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 we pull our children up when they're going wrong because we love them. We're wanting to be kind. We're wanting to do them the favor of learning the right way and the right direction to go. And the sorrow the Holy Spirit produces in our hearts when we sin is motivated by God's kindness because he knows what is best for us. Romans 2 verse 4 says, Do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance and the teaching of the Bible is that when God manifests kindness, grace, and love to us, then we're moved to change. There's nothing like a free gift, you know, to reveal pride in us. Do you know, proud, pride, pride, proud people find it very hard to receive a gift. They find that really hard. They'll do all they can to repay you in some way. Uh, and a... So, because a proud person finds it hard to receive, a proud person finds it hard to come to God, to receive from God, because there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. It's all of grace and mercy and kindness. That's fantastic. And it means that shameless people like me can be forgiven <laughs> without worrying about it. Bless the Lord. You know... Pride and self-sufficiency are the arch enemies of sanctification and God's work in our lives because pride wants to earn his blessing. God wants to give freely. Ephesians uh, 3, 17 to 19 says this, So that Christ may dwell richly in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth? There's four dimensions there, isn't there? Breadth, length, height and, height, height and depth. And to know the love of God which surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. That's what Paul was praying for them. God wants us to spiritually comprehend by faith that his love is boundless and unfathomable and great. And if only as God's people we could see his love, the greatness of it, and, and could anchor our faith to that, it would strengthen our resolve and move us towards increased holiness. And when we see and appreciate God's kindness towards us, we'll be moved to repent. I, I think I've told you this a few times, but it always comes to my mind. It made a really deep impression on me. When I was a young fella... Anybody heard my Mrs. Woodall story? Mrs. Woodall was the mayor of Richmond, or Lady Mayoress of Richmond at one time. And she was in our assembly, part of our church. And Mrs. Woodall used to say things to my mum in my hearing. Oh, Mrs. Coyle, you've got lovely children. You're Alan and you're Joan. They're wonderful. And I used to, th and I used to cringe and I used to think, Mrs. Woodall, if only you knew... <laughs> the stuff I do and what I've got up to and etc etc but you know when Mrs Woodall was around I was a paragon of virtue I was wonderful <laughs> now my mum went to work at the, the uh, soldier's home uh, on the Christian soldier's home San soldier's home at, uh, on Catrick and uh, she worked in the canteen there and I mean they were great people and they preached the gospel and all of that sort of stuff but by the time my mum was working there, it was when I was a teenager and the pride and joy of my life was my 650 BSA road rocket, <laughs> okay? And in fact, I'd, I'd only got the pair of jeans I stood up in. I was at the stage in life where my mum says, you're earning now, you can buy your own clothes, but I bought a motorbike instead. <laughs> and so I had very little in the way of, you know, other than me jeans and me leather jacket and me motorbike. And... The halls, uh, oh sorry, I didn't mean to mention the name. Anyway, the, the, the people who ran the place s said, said to someone, we do feel sorry for Mrs. Coyle with that young tear about of a son she's got. 
you know, she's such a lovely Christian lady. What a pity her son wasn't turning out like, her, like she is. And because that got back to me, do you know, every time I met the people who'd said that, I just thought, right, I think that's what I'm like. That's what I'm like. And I was a tear away in, in their eyes, okay? But when Mrs. Woodall was around, <laughs> oh, Mrs. Woodall, would you like a look at my motorbike? I'll take you for a ride on it if you want. <laughs> What I'm saying is, when somebody believes well of you, what a liberating thing it is. And you know, although God knows the truth about us, he calls us sons and daughters of his. He loves us. He calls us saints. And in the, you know, we know a saint to be someone who's born again of God's spirit. But in the sort of classical idea of the word saint, most of us are anything but. But the Lord calls us that. And I tell you what, we grow up into it. We're growing up into Christ. He calls us sons of God, so we become like Jesus. Don't you think God is fantastic in his psychology? Fantastic. I, I, I just remember that dawning on me once. Uh, when I was sort of being heavy with someone, I thought, hang on. Start believing in people. Start cutting them a bit of slack. Start affirming them rather than running them down. It'll, it'll work wonders for them. And it'll bring blessing into their lives. Hallelujah. I've just about forgotten where I was at. Yeah, if only we could see God's great love and his, and his desires for us, it would transform our lives. Um, there was a time when, in the book of Leviticus, God called on his people uh, to consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am holy. God is a holy God. And if we're going to relate to him and walk with him, we need to start getting our lives in order. Now, God is very gracious. He's a lot more gracious than most churches are. He'll overlook a lot of our faults and failings. But he is looking to see that we're on the road and that we're allowing him to make changes in our lives. Do you know, when, when I was a pastor in, in the church in Malvern, there was a really lovely guy in the church, but he would never, ever, ever come to the breaking of bread service and uh, his name was Eddie and one day when I was visiting Eddie I said Eddie you're there at everything else Bible studies prayer meetings and all the rest you never come to the breaking of bread why is that and he would never ever tell me and uh, he said no I can't come I can't come and one day his son who was an elder in the church said to me Alan it's because my dad smoked, smokes, and somebody in the church really laid it on heavy, and he said he's been condemned ever since, and he just feels totally unworthy. Now listen, I'm not condemning anybody who smokes. There'll probably be the odd one here. God isn't bothered about that. All God's bothered about is that we respond to the Holy Spirit. And sure, the Lord will put his finger on things in our lives and we'll change them because we love him and want to please him, but not because we're nagged into it. Jill will tell you, my lovely wife there, that I don't respond well to nagging. <laughs> Sorry, I should rephrase that. Jill never nags. <laughs> she, she has conversations with me. <laughs> which I interpret as nagging. And, and, it, it, and I, I don't know if other guys here, I've, I've said to many women, uh, ladies, in, certainly in Malvern, who had unsaved husbands, for goodness sake, don't nag the guy to death. Just love him, be a good wife, pray for him. You know, build him up, not pull him down. And, you know, because preaching at him and constantly nagging him will just drive him away, on the whole. I mean, there might be the odd guy that it works with, but it certainly wouldn't have worked with me. In fact, Jill once said to me, I just thank God that I married you when you were a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> There'd have been no chance I could have ever got you anywhere near something that you didn't want to go to. I'm just wondering whether... No, perhaps I should just move on. <laughs> We need to return to a lifestyle of personal holiness. And if God has put his finger on something this weekend, it's because he loves you. And because he intends 
to work his grace in you and to change you. Isn't that fantastic? When God comes along and looks at the car and taps the sills and says, God, these need welding. It's really because he's saying, will you allow me to weld them for you? Or whatever. Poor example, but you get the idea. Um, what really pleases God in the Christian life? Is it how many verses we've memorised? I can remember our pastor getting us all to memorise screeds and screeds of, of the Bible to, to win a Lord John Wharton. Anybody heard of him? Bible, that's right. And if we could learn and recite so many scriptures, we could win one of these Bibles. Okay. And I'm sure it pleases God when we try to memorise scripture. But is that what really pleases God? How many verses we've memorised? Is it our Sunday attendance record at the church? Um, is it how much money we've given to God? Or how many we've influenced for salvation? Is it how many church functions we attend during the week? Perhaps it's the number of leadership positions we have held. Well, all of that, those things might have their place, but none of that really bothers God at all. What truly honours God, according to Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, is our spiritual service of worship to God. And what is that? To be all dreamy and drippy? No, the Bible says it's to present our bodies as living, holy sacrifices to him. Praise God. You, you know, you've heard of people who say, I'm with you in spirit. And I can remember once my pastor turning around to someone. He could be a bit, uh, he could be a bit straight at times, which was good. Uh, unless he was being too straight with me. <laughs> and, and he would say, it would be a pity if we, it would be great to see body and soul get together. No, body and spirit get together now and then. When he said, I'm with you in spirit. And he says, well, can't you bring your body along or send it along as well? God wants our hearts, and he wants our hearts wholly devoted to him. And uh, Cliff was very honest earlier in the day when he was saying how when he was a young Christian, he loved the place of prayer. And I know he prays now and, 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 and gives God time and, and that in prayer anyway. Uh, but I, I can remember the days when I was in my sort of late teens, early 20s, when we used to have all-night prayer meetings, you know, because we were hungry for God. I can remember our pastor waking up a row of sleeping teenagers, me being one of them, and just saying, listen, you're all asleep, why don't you go home to bed? About, I think about 1.30 or 2 in the morning, he just said, we'll try another all-night of prayer later on. But the spirit was willing, even if the flesh was weak. Uh, God wants to see us devoted to him. And the Lord has, this weekend, and, and I've heard most of this ministry before, but the Lord's still spoken to me. And there are areas where I say, yeah, Lord, I've, I've, got, to, I've got to do something about that. And by your grace, I will. Can I just say that having this lovely light subject of repentance at the end of the week... I want to say that in actual fact, it doesn't have to be. You don't have to be all doom and gloom and, and, and looking at the floor. If God is, or crying and weeping, I mean, that might happen. I'm not saying that that shouldn't happen. But if God has just told you something that's wrong, for goodness sake, just put it right. To me, it's just very straightforward. You'll have seen T-shirts, haven't you, that say, just do it. Well, I think when it comes to repentance, it's just a matter of just do it. If God has told you, I'd like to see that change in your life, well, don't make a song and dance about it. Do it. And he'll give you the grace and he'll give you the strength and the help. And he doesn't condemn us. The Bible says there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And he wants us to live in obedience to his revealed will. He wants us not to give our bodies which belong to God and are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit to the corruption and filth of the world, he wants us to give it to him for his service. And you know, holiness is not about keeping rules and impressing God or others. It's about an attitude of our hearts. Praise God. 
Who do we really love? What motivates us? It's all about doing God's will. And revival cannot and will not happen without Christians who are committed to holiness. And holiness just basically means separating yourself to God. Stuff that God doesn't like, you know, putting that to one side. Um, I, I used to be a retained fireman many years ago when, when I was about six foot something. <laughs> I was never tall enough, but they were short. They were desperate. Okay. <laughs> They used to use me when they had to do the live carry-downs from the third floor of the tower. They'd say, well, Alan's nice and light. They were supposed to carry a 10-stone man down on their backs, but they used to use me. I was about 8 stone 12 in them days. A bit heavier now. I um, don't know what I was going on, go on about there. Perhaps it doesn't really matter. Shall I just move on? <laughs> I've, lost me, I've lost me thread now. Um... We need to be committed to holiness. Oh, that was it. One, uh, one, one of the guys in, in the fire station afterwards said to me, Alan, why is it that you don't do? And he mentioned something which in itself wasn't necessarily wrong, but something I didn't do. And I said, well, that's because I'm trying to please the Lord, and I, I just reckon the Lord would rather I didn't do that. And there was another guy who um, had a brother who was a Christian, and he said, oh, my brother's one of you born again lot, but he does that. And I said, yeah, that's fine for him. I said, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying as part of my journey with the Lord, he's put his finger on that and said, Alan, I'd rather you didn't. So I don't. I said, but if you become a Christian, it doesn't mean you've not got to do that. It's only if God puts his finger on it. it no, it wasn't, you're all wondering what on earth was it, and I'm not going to tell you, Okay. <laughs> But it wasn't something desperately sinful. It was just a matter of, of, of a particular lifestyle. And I just felt, God doesn't want me to do that. The one thing it did do was it, it caused guys to say to me, Alan, why? What makes you tick? Why do you do that or don't do the other? And so we need to be committed to holiness. And basically that's to pleasing God. Hebrews 12 verse 14 says, Pursue peace with all men. And the sanctification with, with, without which no one will see the Lord. And a sanctified life or a life set apart for God means everything if we want to impact the lives of others. You know, the world can spot a hypocrite pretty fast. Perhaps you've seen someone and just thought, oh, you know, they're just posing. They're, you know, they're not for real. There's something in us, isn't there, that picks out any hypocrisy that we think we see. Um, and uh, sometimes God can use the world to actually help sanctify us. Because I, I remember in the workshop once letting the side down as far as the Lord goes. And one of the guys said to me, you're supposed to be a Christian. And I remember saying to him, yeah, I am. But I've just uh, blown it there. Apologize. See the, the, and, but God used... That guy who did far worse things than what i just done <laughs> to actually pick me up. So I think it's a good thing for Christians to sometimes have to, to make a stand for the Lord in the world where they work and to take the flack that comes their way because God can use it to bring about a work of holiness in our lives. Um, Titus, Paul wrote this to Titus. And chapter 2, verse 6 to 8 of his letter to him says this. Urge the young men to be sensible. God, that's a tall order. <laughs> sensible young men. <laughs> there are some. Urge the young men to be sensible. In all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds. With purity in doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach. So that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us fantastic do you know it would be so interesting to go around and talk to some of your neighbours maybe you talk to some of mine friends and acquaintances and say come on spill the beans what's so and so like and then to hear things like do you know they're not perfect but they're wonderful people they love the Lord 
they really go out of their way to help people, to help me. They've been such a source of encouragement and strength to me. I think that will be said about a lot of people here. Fantastic, isn't it? When the world outside can speak well of you. Can you imagine a church that gives the world absolutely nothing bad to say about it because of the way it's living and the stuff it's doing in the community? Wouldn't that be brilliant? Um, do you know, when we live a righteous and holy life, it paves the way for the gospel. A church that tolerates anything less than being serious about sin and addressing issues that are wrong uh, is baffling. Sin must be addressed in preaching and in evangelism. An answered prayer is also at stake. Psalm 66 verse 18 says, If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. So if you're planning something bad, the Lord's not going to take too much notice of your prayer. He wants to see a sincere heart. Not saying you've got to be perfect to have your prayers answered, but you've got to have a heart that's pure towards him. Hallelujah. And that's a condition of heart when we know we're in the wrong before God and then we confess it and are willing to put it right. God wants to see purity in his people. It must be highly insulting to God when we strut into his presence arrogantly without dealing with sin in our lives. God wants to see brokenness, contrition. And, and you know, that sounds miserable and woe is me. It isn't, you know. The, the man who went into the temple in that story Jesus told beat on his breast and looked at the ground because he felt really convicted of his sinfulness said God be merciful to me a sinner Jesus said he went home justified and that's a great thing to be right with God is joyful and wonderful um, you know we often sing a song in church or we used to sing it more in days gone by but we sing it occasionally at New Life uh, come just as you are to worship and uh, I remember once when we were singing it in Malvern, somebody came to me afterwards and says, you shouldn't have that song in church. Come just as you are. You know, you mean we should just come casually to God and it, and it doesn't matter how we come. And I said, no, no, no. You, you can make it say that if you, if you twist the, the idea that was in the writer's ha mind and heart. He was just saying, come as you are. Come as you are to worship the Lord. He'll receive you. With all your fallen brokenness and sinfulness, if your heart is saying, but Lord, you can change me and forgive me, please, then come as you are. You don't have to get... Is it wrong to say tarted up? <laughs> I'm not quite sure what I can say here and what I can't. You don't have to get all dressed up. Oh, that's it. Dolled up. God knows what you like anyway, and God will receive you as you are. Uh, you know, sin separates us from God, but the fact that we sin doesn't break our relationship with God. But the Holy Spirit will tap on the door and say, hey, what about? And if we don't deal with it, that might break our relationship with God, or it will set it back a bit. Um, we can't b uh, blaze into church with, shall we say, spiritually filthy garments and think God doesn't mind that we've come just as we are, in that sense, uh, with our, all our sins there. It doesn't work that way. We've got to deal with our sins. But Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. He'd got a, he'd got a list as long as his arm of sins. That's why he was on the cross next to Jesus. And he was forgiven because his heart was contrite and broken and open to the Lord. In other words, he was repentant. And listen, he hadn't got time to go through the waters of baptism, which is a good thing to do. He hadn't got time to go and put things right with his, anybody he had offended or upset. He was dying, for goodness sake. He only had an hour or two left. But God saw his heart. Jesus saw his heart and said, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Fantastic. You know, he's my brother now and yours. One day we'll get to meet him. He'll probably say, I wish I'd known all this earlier. 
I might have had a bigger reward. <laughs> but I've, my reward is I've, I've escaped the clutches of Satan and I'm in the Lord's presence and kingdom. Um, you know, sin has to be dealt with and a sinning brother must be confronted. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. I, I've got a friend. He doesn't live anywhere near me. And it's not by design. It's not that I've avoided him. And um, I can remember once, uh, he's a sort of friend who was always red hot for the Lord. And he just seemed to have a nose that could sniff out anything that wasn't right. In fact, he did operate uh, in the gifts of the Spirit, words of wisdom, knowledge, you know, revelation, all that sort of stuff. Lovely man, uh, but very difficult bloke to be around for long because he sniffed stuff out. Do you know what I mean? In fact, Jill once said, and she, and she said it to him eventually, she says, you know, you're just about the only person I've nearly thrown out of our house. <laughs> but the Bible says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. And I can look back on him and think, do you know, that man has loved me and Jill enough to be honest with us, even when it could have cost our friendship. And it has cost his friendship with some people. And perhaps he's not the wisest of people, but hey, I'd rather know where it's at than anything else. In fact, when he would come and preach in the church at Malvern, he used to put his fingers on so many needs that God revealed to him that there were some folk when he was coming would stay away. And somebody said to me, why on earth do you invite so-and-so? And I said, because he can do things in God that I can't. I said, listen, I know when he, I said, if you've got a wall that needs knocking down, you call in a man with a big hammer. And I said, when the man with the big hammer's gone, even if there's a bit of mess left, you can soon sweep it up and tidy up afterwards. I says, and I'm quite happy to tidy up after he's been because he achieves things in the realm of the spirit that are beyond the anointing on me to do. And we benefited from, from his ministry. Anyway, I'm digressing now. Um, you know, perhaps sometimes we don't care enough about sin. Well, God's grace is not something to be mocked or taken for granted. Psalm 24, I think we had this verse earlier, verse 3 and 4 says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Praise God. The Bible says Satan is a prow prowling lion seeking whom he may devour. Maybe he won't lure you into immorality. Perhaps he, perhaps he can distract you from loving God and serving God in the way you should. Uh, you know, there's more to life than just going to work, eating three meals a day and putting some money away. There's a spiritual battle going on for the souls of our nation. And uh, all the devil needs to do is to distract us from our mission and calling. And many people, as a result, will lose out and end up in a lost eternity. We can't serve God. And uh, the old-fashioned word is, and mammon. Or we can't serve God and money, or, or the God of money. We can't serve God and wealth. Now get this in balance. We need money. Even Jim needed money when he needed to buy a farm. <laughs> but uh, we can't serve money. God will supply what we need in his way. Very often in a way that we don't expect. So if we're uh, allured by the here and now, and we're not allured by God, we've got to address that and say, God has got to be the number one in my life. So really, we need to evaluate our hearts to see if there might be a spiritual bondage in our lives to the material things of life around us. God said through Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your hearts. You know, too many, too many of us maybe are overloading ourselves uh, with enormous amounts of activity and busyness. Do you know, when I read the story of Mary and Martha, I think I've often identified more with Mary, sorry, Martha, than I have with Mary. And uh, I've sort of struggled over that scripture when Ma Martha says, Lord, can't you tell Mary to get off her bottom and help me? 
were in effect. And, God, and the Lord said to her, Mar uh, Mary's chosen the better part. I'm not going to take that away from her. I like to think that maybe after Jesus had finished sharing with them all, that he might have just leaned across to Mary and said, how about going and giving Martha a hand? Because <laughs> he does care about practical stuff as well. But you know, sometimes the challenges that we do overload ourselves. You know, it's great to have a good work ethic, but we can overdo anything. We can overdo leisure. We can overdo activity as well. And, uh, but by God's grace, if the Lord has touched anything like that this weekend, we can, uh, we can repent of it and put it right. The good news is we can live in victory over sin. We're not forced to obey our fleshly desires. The person who walks the way of the Spirit is putting to death the deeds of the flesh. And that's where true life is found. Hallelujah. Um, 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you may be able to endure it. Anybody here ever been tempted and then decided, I don't want to look too hard for the way out, because I rather fancy that sin? No? Well, if I'm honest, I've been there, but I'm ashamed of it. It shouldn't be. We shouldn't be there. God will provide a way out if we really want to honour him and to serve. We're all tempted, and, and inevitably, at times, we may stumble. But the promise of God is that he's faithful to bring us through temptation without having to give in to sin. And our weakness is that we try to endure and escape by our own power rather than the means of escape which are through Christ. Okay, so Christians here, don't live any longer like you're chained to the devil. All right? And enslaved by the power of, the, of sin. Don't come into church on a Sunday feeling defeated and weak after a week of giving in to the devil. I mean, still come to church if that's been your case. But then look to be set free and to walk out in the power of the spirit of life in Christ. And really, it all comes down to repentance. If we repent, revival can come. We must humble ourselves. And it's hard to admit when you've been in the wrong. You know, sorry really is the hardest word, even when it's to God. We need to pray and seek God's face and repent. And uh, that is truly, I believe, the beginning of revi revival. So maybe already you know things that you need to change. Things that God has put his finger upon. And so it's, it's, a, it's a matter of what you're going to do about it. What are you going to do about it? We can pray, we can stand before the Lord and ask for his help and his anointing. Or we can just go out and think I'll feel better in the morning and just let it all pass. Do you know that would be the biggest tragedy of all? Um, who was it said, if not now, when? And was, it, was it Gorbachev or somebody? So, some, uh, so, so, some, some leader... Somewhere said, if, if not us, then who? And if not now, when? I don't know quite the context of it. It just occurred to me. But, you know, let's put things right with God. If not now, when? Okay. If not me, then who? Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Bless the Lord.